Father, we thank you that you're present here with us. We thank you for this family, for the privilege and joy of being a part of the family of God. Lord, it truly is a privilege to gather together at your feet, to proclaim your greatness together, to remind each other of who we are as ambassadors of Jesus, to recognize the broken world that we live in, but to also recognize that you have overcome it. And so today we come asking you, Holy Spirit, to transform our hearts as we hear your word. Make us more like your son, Jesus. Fill us with his life, with his mind, with his eyes, with his perspective. And Lord, may your church rise up throughout the world, bringing your kingdom. We pray for our nation. God, there is so much dissension right now. People digging their heels in, holding to their ideologies with a firm grip. God, we ask, may we be different. May we be a people who recognize your presence in the world. May we be a people who would be uh, listening to others, compassionate, proclaiming your kingdom. God, may we look to you. You are our salvation. We give our hearts to you this morning, Lord. Fill us with your spirit and transform us as we hear from your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. You know, as we were listening to that last song in Christ Alone, that's really one of my favorites. I'm usually, I prefer more hymns, but that's one of my favorite modern songs, and it's so rich theologically and so deep. It's, I don't even know how to follow up that song, but I'll do my best. <laughs> It's so great to be up here again in front of you all and, and get to preach God's word again. I always cherish these opportunities because I get to convey a message that hopefully makes us love and glorify our creator that much more. If you don't know me, my name is Justin Wheaton, and I'm an intern here at Christ Church Highland Park. Now go ahead and open up your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Colossians. We're going to be going through chapter 2, verses 8 through 23. And I do want to mention that this passage is filled with so much theological content that it's going to take a while for us to go through it. So buckle up, because we're going to be here for a few hours. <laughs> Just kidding. We're not able to cover everything. However, as I was preparing for this message today, I wanted to focus on one particular concept found in this passage, and that's deceptive philosophy. This is the key idea of my sermon today. Paul's words that he wrote to these churches 2,000 years ago could have easily been spoken to us today. But before we get into it, I want to mention that, like I did with my last message, I'm going to keep using pictures in my sermons. This is because we learn better and things stick more if we can see what we're talking about. For example, we're in the book of Colossians. A lot of us don't have a picture in our minds of what Colossae looked like or where it was in the world. And likewise, many of us also can't picture Laodicea, the second city that this letter was written to. Plus, pictures make learning more fun. I came to this realization a while ago talking to Liam in the youth group. Why do kids get really cool pictures in their books, but all of a sudden when you turn into an adult, you just have words on your pages? <laughs> Seeing what we're talking about takes things out of the, field, out of the theoretical and makes them real. When we read the Bible, we're talking about real places with real events containing real people. So having said that, here is where Colossae and Laodicea are on a map. So as we can see, this is a modern map of the world today. We've got Italy on the left. Moving to the right, we've got Greece and then Turkey. And then Israel moving down the coast of the eastern Mediterranean. And then Egypt next to that. And then the rest of the coast of North Africa. Colossae and Laodicea are located in Turkey. So now let me, look, let me show you another picture. This is another map of the Mediterranean Sea, but in biblical times. See how we have the same land masses as in the previous map. The world has not changed that much. 
And you might be trying to find Colossae and Laodicea on this map, but the words are very small. <laughs> I can't even see them from here. Let me zoom in a bit and help you out. Here they are in the red circle. Notice that they're located in southwestern Turkey, just northwest of Israel and east of Italy and Greece. Paul wrote Colossians to the church in Colossae, but in chapter 4, he says to also read this letter to the church in Laodicea. Now, having established where we're talking about, let me begin with a word of prayer. Lord, maker of heaven and earth, who made the sea, the dry land, and all that's in them, all the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Please bless our time here today and be with me as I share a message meant to glorify you. My hope is that you speak to the hearts of those listening and that in some way they're blessed by the hearing and exposition of your word. Amen. Amen. All right, now let me give you a quick, very quick background on Colossians. This is the city of Colossae. Now, as you can see, there's not much left of it, just the mound. It was a great city in the 4th and 3rd centuries B.C., but, as Pastor Harold mentioned last week, it became a very minor city in Paul's day, and it was next to the much greater cities of Hierapolis and Laodicea. Sadly, this place has only been undergoing excavation since 2021, which means that we don't know a lot archaeologically yet. But looking at the picture, we can see the Acropolis at the top, which is where the palace was, the Agora, which takes up the majority of the bottom, is the city center. And then the theater over to the right is where the people would go for entertainment. And then Laodicea, on the other hand, has had much more archaeological work done. It's your standard Greco-Roman ruin. And in Paul's day, it was a booming city. These are the settings of Paul's letter to the Colossians. The letter was possibly written from Rome, though Ephesus has been advocated by some during either AD 60 or 61 to a mostly Gentile audience. Now on to chapter two. Verse eight says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. The opening verse of this passage is so important and especially relevant to us today, to Christians then and us now. And because of this, I wanna spend some time here it's difficult to identify exactly which group or teachings that Paul is addressing here. There are many possibilities, such as Jewish, Greek, or Roman philosophies. What we can know for sure, though, is that Paul did not want the churches in Colossae or Laodicea to be persuaded by these people. In fact, Paul used the word sulagogeo here, which is an extremely rare word in the Greek language and denotes carrying off something as plunder. This is very strong language from Paul, illustrating how important it was to him that these churches not become captive or carried off as plunder to these false teachings that led them away, that would lead them away from Jesus. Sadly, the same foundation for these deceptive philosophies, these false teachings that the Colossians and Laodiceans dealt with 2,000 years ago, are the same that we deal with today. Think about it. There's been a huge attack on Jesus in the Bible with the rise of atheism, New Age philosophy, Islam, heretical Christian teachers, and many others in recent history. I'm sure we've all encountered at least some opposition, or maybe read about it, or seen videos. Deceptive philosophies are all around us. Let me give you some examples. The New Atheism Movement, led by people like evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins, or even the 90s icon Bill Nye the Science Guy, makes it their mission to demonstrate that one, Christianity is evil, and two, God is not real, by using what they think are complex, intelligent arguments. Bart Ehrman, another example, who's a professor of New Testament at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, he asserts that we cannot trust the New Testament or what it says because of how it was written and how the manuscripts were transmitted. Now, even though he studies New Testament, he's not a Christian. You will hear some of the most deceptive teachings from people who claim to be Christians. One of the big names that's out there right now is Brandon Robertson, who perverts clear biblical teachings to push his agenda. In order to do this, he has to abandon scriptural authority, inerrancy, and more. 
In our youth group a few weeks ago, I showed them a video of a Christian who presented some wild claims with no knowledge of the Hebrew language or the ancient Near East and very little knowledge of the Bible. But because he made it sound smart and had good production value, he got tons of views on Facebook. My point in giving these few examples is that you'll often hear convincing sounding arguments from opponents of the Bible that sound like they know what, they, they know what they're talking about. Take TikTok, YouTube, or Facebook, for example. Unfortunately, the popularity of these apps makes the content on there, especially religious content, seem very persuasive. However, I do want to encourage you to closely examine the claims that you hear. These content creators usually have no credentials, start with different presuppositions like naturalism or materialism, or have misunderstandings about the text themselves. Much of the time, these videos or arguments can't withstand scrutiny. And these are the kinds of things that Paul is warning about. And by the way, I'm happy to talk with anyone who wants to go more in depth on how to answer critics of the Bible. In my field of Old Testament studies, I have to interact with opposition constantly. So I'm familiar with many of the arguments out there. Some things that my wife Caitlin and I do for fun is watch Bible-related debates, read books by critics, or watch YouTube videos by opponents. Most of the things can be answered by just seeing what the Bible says about that topic. What these kinds of human teachings do is aim to take us away from the truth that God revealed to us through his word. When you don't have God on your side, your philosophies, your beliefs, they fall flat and don't produce fruit. In other words, them dogs don't hunt. <laughs> Look at the state of Western society right now, with God either being taken out of everything or taken out of everything. That's why I want Paul's words from this verse to be the focal point of this sermon. It relates directly to our current situations today. If you don't remember anything else from this message, remember, see to it that no one takes you captive through deceptive and hollow philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. But how do we prevent ourselves from being persuaded by false teachings and deceptive philosophy? Starting in the next few verses, Paul gives us the true teaching that we are to stay rooted in. So let's look at verses 9 through 12. And remember, Paul's going to draw a lot on, on Colossians 1, 15 through 20. So verses 9 through 12 read, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. In Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. I want us to take a second and just think about that. Paul's quoting Colossians 1.19 here, which in turn is a quote from what is considered as the earliest Christian hymn, giving the explicit claim that Jesus is God. Even before the book of Colossians was written in the 60s, Jesus' divinity was a central belief by his followers. Everything that makes God God is present in Jesus. The Colossians and Laodiceans were facing some sort of false teaching that taught something else about Jesus or taught the worship of other gods. However, Paul is clear that in Jesus, they had everything that they needed. They could find their fulfillment in Christ. And like them, we have all that we need in Jesus. To quote Douglas Moo, a New Testament scholar, in Jesus and in him alone, God has decisively and exhaustively revealed himself. All that we can know or experience of God is therefore found in our relationship with him. The Colossians and Laodiceans should also not be fooled into thinking other spiritual powers were worthy of being worshipped. As Paul says at the end of verse 10, Jesus is the head over every power and authority. We all get tempted by the devil. Even Jesus got tempted by the devil. But remember, Jesus holds authority over everything. He created the devil. 
So why worship a lesser creature when we can worship and be in a relationship with the creator himself? Paul then goes on to talk about circumcision. Because the churches were facing some sort of alternate philosophy that taught a different way, a different circumcision without hands. Now, it doesn't appear that physical circumcision is in view here. He says that they were circumcised with a circumcision, circumcision that was not done by human hands. The only kind of circumcision that Paul could be talking about or that he could draw on here that's not done by human hands is a circumcision of the heart. This concept goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It can be found in Deuteronomy 30. It refers to God acting in the hearts of his people and allowing them to be in a true relationship with him. That may be what Paul is referring to. He, talk, he talks about this in other places as well. The focus here is the softening of calloused hearts. The Colossians and Laodiceans should not be led astray by false teachers teaching about some other symbolic circumcision because God has already given them a circumcised heart. And like them, God has given us a circumcised heart and allowed us to enter into a relationship with him, thus making us capable of overcoming the slavery of sin. Verses 13 through 15 say, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphant, triumphing over them by the cross. Here, Paul goes into detail on exactly what God did for them because of his great love for his creation through the sacrificial act of Jesus' death on the cross. This was important for Paul to mention because there were some cults that claimed to offer rebirth or new life through rituals. The Colossians and Laodiceans were previously dead in their sins, but God made them alive and forgave them. Not only that, but Jesus' death and resurrection triumphed over the forces of evil, both earthly and spiritually, putting them to shame, making a public spectacle out of them. Jesus even triumphed over death itself. And just as with the Colossians and Laodiceans, God has made us alive through Jesus' atoning death, his atoning work on the cross. He has given us another way to find forgiveness for our sins and enter into a proper relationship with God. Verses 16 through 19 go on to say, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to religious festivals, a new moon celebration, or Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual minds. They have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Because of the Colossians and Laodiceans' faiths in Jesus, they could not be judged by outward acts or cultic rituals from the various groups that surrounded them. Paul listed in verse 16, food, religious festivals, new moons, Sabbath days. And this may sound like a list of purely Jewish elements, but the Greeks and Romans around them also had religious festivals, food observances, and new moon celebrations. Paul's listing a multitude of things here to cover a vast array of religious groups that the Colossians and Laodiceans would or did encounter. For example, the moon god Mem was worshipped in different ways according to the cycle of the moon. Another moon god named Selene was worshipped at Colossae, along with the gods Artemis and Hecate. These practices are not able to give them salvation and did not justify them before God because they were already justified purely because of their faiths in Jesus. And just like them, don't let anyone tell you that there are things that you have to do in order to find salvation. Salvation is a free gift from God to all of those who place their faith in Jesus. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, 
For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Anyone who claims something other than this teaching is deceptive philosophy. And as we read our final set of verses, notice that Paul is now talking about the teachings of the world. Verses 20 through 23 read, Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. In these verses, Paul switches from exhorting the Colossians and the Laodiceans to be weary of deceptive teachings to questioning them as to why they still submit to the world's rules. They know that the world is controlled by the evil one and that their salvation is in Christ alone. He places the burden on them. These cultic and ritualistic rules, taboos, and prohibitions will all pass away. They're not eternal. Rather than being from God, they're from humans who are fallible and corrupt. They may seem wise, but if they don't come from God, then they're folly. Think about it. The world today loves to dress up these deceptive teachings to look wise or to look like they're from God. Think of the notion of his truth or her truth. This is the idea that as long as someone wants to believe something, no matter what it is, it's real to them and therefore true. When you abandon an objective truth from God, everything becomes meaningless and subjective, where it's impossible to determine what truth actually is and who's right or wrong. Think about naturalism, the view that only the natural world exists. In this worldview, there is no God, there's no soul, there are no angels, no demons, there's no supernatural realm. Atheists who hold to this love to overwhelm their opponents with seemingly irrefutable scientific claims or philosophical arguments. The problem is, they often start with false assumptions or are closed-minded to any other viewpoints but their own. And I could go on and on listing things that are contrary to God. But Paul is asking that because we know the truth revealed to us by God, because we have salvation through Jesus Christ. Why do we still live by the morals, by the rules, by the beliefs of the world around us that wants nothing more than to erase Jesus, erase God, erase the Bible from existence? That is something that I want us all to think about and meditate on. And to conclude today's sermon, I want to reiterate what Paul said in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. Instead of being taken captive by these teachings, stay firm in your foundation from God, being studied in the Word. And as Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that, is, that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. If you encounter something that seems wrong or you're unsure of, don't automatically abandon the Bible. And just to be clear, there are legitimate questions that could be asked. But earnestly seek to find an answer. It's important to look at, at what the Bible says about that issue. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the times the answers can be found just by reading the text. The Bible can defend itself. However, if you have some questions that are a little more complex, there are a myriad of other resources at your fingertips. We live in a time where there is more information available than any other point in history, which is both a good and a bad thing. Study Bibles can be a great go-to for answering questions. They come with study notes that give us more information and allow us to think critically about what we're reading. And I'm preaching from a study Bible right now. Commentaries are plentiful 
And they go deeper into specific passages and often give you answers to your questions from scholars who've already done the legwork for you. Some commentaries are better than others, though, so keep that in mind. There are also Bible dictionaries that give insight into biblical people, places, things, and concepts. Another great, another great resource is catechisms. We've gotten away from these in the church today, but these are designed to answer questions of what we believe and why. The Westminster Larger Catechism, or its, its, its sister, the Shorter Catechism, is a great place to start. And in fact, one of the songs that we sang this morning, our second song called Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death, is from the Westminster Larger Catechism. And there's so many more resources out there. I find a big reason why that Christians leave the faith or are convinced by these deceptive teachings is because they don't know where to look to find answers. Ask your pastors your questions. If they don't know the answer, they can direct you where you can find it. Above all, stay in your Bibles. This is the literal word of God that he gave to us. Stay strong in our faiths. And combating false teaching begins right here. And finally, I want to end with what we are to remain rooted in. Flip back to Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. Remember, it is possibly one of the first and earliest Christian hymns that Paul is quoting from. He writes, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all the creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. If we have a strong foundation, then we cannot be shaken. A few weeks ago, we had a bad storm by our house with strong winds. The next morning, we discovered that a giant tree near our apartment had fallen over because of the wind. If that tree had stronger roots like the trees around it did, it would not have fallen. That is the perfect metaphor for us today. If we don't build strong roots, we get knocked over by opposition. And upon inspecting the tree when we went over to it, we found out that it was dead and rotting inside, which aided in its falling over. If we don't have strong roots in Jesus, we become dead, and we will ultimately fall over. Thank you for being here today. Let me end with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to proclaim your word today. I pray that I was able to effectively communicate what you wanted us to hear, and that we all grow in our relationship with you because of it. Please bless everyone here and grant them an even greater love for your word and a fire in the hearts so that they want to pursue you constantly. Please give us the wisdom to recognize false teachings and the ability to seek out answers to our questions. Please, Holy Spirit, be with us always. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.